Good afternoon. Oh, that's a weak start. Come on. Good afternoon. Are you excited to be here? This is one of the biggest events, I think, in church life. It, it's right there with baptisms and, and first communions, if you come from that tradition. This is right here with the of a pastor is, um, well, it, it just is, there's nothing quite like it. So as we go along, um, I hope that you uh, pay close attention and uh, be sure to congratulate um, Pastor Carol um, at, the, at the close of this. And we will be having uh, a time of refreshment and all of that in the fellowship hall immediately following. Hang around for that. Um, we, we are asking folks, remember to wear your masks and try to social distance as best you can. Um, but really, that's not what we're here for, is it? We're here to celebrate with God the calling of one of his servants. Let's sing, We Gather Together. Page three, what page? Three, oh, 387, but the words will also be up here. Let's stand. Gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known wicked oppressing now sees from praises to his name he forgets not his own side us to guide us our God with us joining ordaining may take his kingdom divine so from the beginning, the fight we are winning. Thou, Lord, was at our side. Glory be thine. You may be seated. As I said, we are gathered here today to ordain, um, and which means really recognize God's call on a person's life. As we share and celebrate today, let's make this a joyous occasion. Amen? Amen. <laughs> oh, it, I guess I did. I thought, the, never mind. I thought the invocation was then, and then we did that. <laughs> Throughout history, God has called workers to carry out his will. Righteous Noah was chosen to survive the flood and save his family through the building of an ark. Abraham, the man of faith, was selected to be the forerunner of God's holy nation. Israel, Moses, the man of God, was called... Um, uh, Moses, the man of God, was called to deliver his people from bondage. Rahab hid the spies and secured Israel's future and was a grandmother to King David and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus chose 12 to be his apostles. The early church set apart those called to special work through prayer and laying on of hands. We can assume that this included Priscilla and Junia, both women whom Paul called to be his fellow workers. Apostles. We come today formally to ordain our sister Carol to the work of, for which God has called her. We seek to honor only Christ, and she is being set apart for that purpose. Let us invoke God's blessing upon this occasion. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing all of us together today. And we thank you most for the calling that you have placed on Carol and that she's answered your call yet again. And we are here to celebrate that. We ask you to be especially present in this place to bless Carol as she moves forward in your work. Amen. Hello. 
Hello. I'm Barbara Gilbert, a longtime friend of Carol Wagner. Um, we know each other from her time as being a Catholic nun, a Dominican nun in the Catholic Church. Um, I've, it's a great pleasure and privilege for Ken and I, my husband Ken, to be here and to celebrate with your community her ordination and to celebrate her gifts and talents in service to your community, my family, and um, really my family is pretty large. You know, Catholics have big families, and I'm from nine, and they'll be watching. My four children are watching. She married two of them, so we're very close. In preparation for this ordination and for my witness of calling, I was trying to remember when I first met her and it was probably not a formal meeting because Carol, as she probably still is, was an unusual nun. Um, she did things rule breaker. Um, she did things that you know just wasn't customary. Um, she's one of the few women I ever saw speak from the pulpit. And she also was very active in training and sharing her faith with, and building community is really what she did. Um, she one time told us a story about how, you know, she, as a Dominican, St. Dominic was bilocational, which meant he could be at two places at once. So Carol described an experience that she had where she was bilocational. She was invited to two events on the same day and pretty much in the same time frame. She went to the first event, said hello to every person there, and then when they, she wasn't presenting or anything, she was just there, and when they came into whatever they were doing, she left. And she went to the other event and said hello to every member at that event, and everybody at both events swore that they both saw her on the same day at the same time. That'll tell you what she's like. But we really worked together in the 90s at St. Albert the Great Catholic Church in Austin. Um, she, was in, she was the director of religious education there. And of course, she didn't just do that. Um, but while she was there, she was very pioneering in bringing things that the Catholic Church really didn't embrace. How did she do it? She's just got that charisma, people believe her, think it's wonderful. I thought it was wonderful. It was Vacation Bible School was one of the first ones that she brought to uh, St. Albert's. Catholics don't typically do that. Um, and in one particular week-long Vacation Bible School, uh, we did all of these amazing events. Just incredible. And we were cleaning up, and one little boy comes up to me and says, Mrs. Gilbert, what are we doing next week? And I said, well, vacation Bible school's over. It's only one week. And, you know, you're going to do what you do every Sunday. He goes, are you kidding me? Is this just going to be a church now? <laughs> and I kind of thought, not while she's here. <laughs> um, anyway, my personal family life has been enriched through Carol. Um, Ken is not originally Catholic, although we were married in the Catholic Church for 15 years when we met her. And um, all four of my children are Catholic. Um, Ken was sitting in Mass with us. We married in the church. Um, but she was the first person to invite him to become Catholic, including me. I didn't invite him. I'm like, you can come sit with us at church. <laughs> no big deal. But I never extended the invitation. Part of the reason was is because the process of becoming Catholic is pretty tough because they make you go to church, leave Mass, go and receive training. So I would have been left in church with four kids by myself. Ain't happening. And she said, it doesn't have to be that way. Go, just go talk to Father Al. And Father Al was a very pastoral priest. And he said, sure, come on Easter Sunday. Or Easter, you know, we'll do it. So now he's Catholic. See what you got into, honey? <laughs> Although we've, we've had some other marriages. But anyhow. Um, bottom line, in my proof of calling, Carol has been through fun, stress, marriage, births, death, triumphs, 
failures, graduations, PhDs, CPAs, business losses, business success, physical, mental, emotional challenges, quarantines, and every challenge of every season. So in preparation for this particular event, I wanted to reflect on what does it mean to be ordained? In the Catholic Church, you know, women don't participate in ordinations. I've been to maybe two, um, but they're not really participation events. And so this is a real honor to be up here and speak on her behalf and just let you know. Um, I look for a few things to understand. What does this mean? What is ordination? Well, it's a ceremony to recognize a person's gifts and efforts that have set them apart from the laity. Like, you got to be special. She's special. This person is consecrated to perform religious sites and ceremonies. Even if you didn't consecrate her, she would be doing that anyway. So then I wanted to go look into scripture and see, you know, where is this based on? Where do we get this? So I found in the Old Testament, God tells Moses to gather Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. And so that was in Exodus. And then in Leviticus, the Lord spoke to Moses, and he asked Moses, gather Aaron and his son, gather the ceremonial garments and the anointing oil. And there were some other things like bulls, rams, I think, and um, unleavened bread and assembled the congregation, and they anointed Aaron and his sons and laid hands on him, which I saw in your program. You're going to do that. It's amazing. Straight from Scripture. In the New Testament, in Romans 16, Paul commends to the faithful their sister, Phoebe, and there were some other, but this was one that was, you know, kind of in the very beginning of that reading as servants of the church. And he asked his followers, welcome her, help her. And in my reflection, I also pondered, what is this worth? What do you get from it? So I read a little passage from Oscar Romero, who was a bishop in San Salvador and was actually assassinated in the 80s. And so far as we are worth anything, it is because we are grafted into Christ's life. This cross and resurrection, that is a person's measure. So what I'm here to say is I believe Carol has grafted her life to Christ's life. She has taken up her cross and followed him. She celebrates the bread of life the resurrection, and the joyful hope of everlasting life. So today, I commend to you, Sister Carol, a faithful servant of God, a follower of Jesus, and a set-apart servant of the church. Welcome her. Help her. And I know you already have. You've welcomed her, and you've helped her. She loves this community deeply, cares about each of, the, each of you. I almost think I know you because I've heard so many stories. And she will serve and help shepherd God's flock. Amen. Good afternoon. I am Karen Shear, and I met Carol through this church. And I have to say I'm honored and, and humbled that she asked me to speak for her. Carol and I have, have formed a very good relationship. It's, it's one that speaks to my heart, and, and I believe it has spoken to hers as well. Um, it's just really blossomed as a friendship 
it's spoken to me spiritually. Most of it has been done over laughter, a lot of laughter. We've, we've done some great things. We've shared books where I'll read a, a chapter of the book and I'll write little notes to her. I'll pass the book to her. She'll write little notes to me. We'll read each other's notes and then we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. We don't always agree. I don't know if, if anybody's ever really sat down and talked to Carol, but you don't, know, <laughs> you don't always agree. We've, um, but we sit down and we talk it out. We've, we've discussed things like people's t-shirts. There was a young man who, who had on a t-shirt, and I won't repeat it here, but he, it was a disparaging remark about God. And we debated it, and we debated it, and we debated it. And at the end of the day, we decided, well, yeah, it's a disparaging remark about God, which means he believed in God. It didn't say, I don't believe in God. It said, God, hmm. And we thought about the conversation, and we talked about the conversation that he would probably have with God once he passed away. And he would register his complaints with God and how God would probably wrap his arms around him and say, that's okay, son. I love you. And I think of all the times that Carol wraps her arms around somebody and says, that's okay. I love you. And how many times she's wrapped her arms around me and said, that's okay, I love you. One of our great debates was over a hymn. My, one of my favorite hymns is In the Garden. What Carol didn't know of me at the time is when you, when you really challenge me on something, I'm going to get on the internet and I'm going to start researching, right? <laughs> so we debated, I think, for a month on the meaning of, of In the Garden. She had her thoughts of what it meant, and I had my thoughts of what it meant. And we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I won, just so y'all know. <laughs> and, and the reason I knew I won, well, A, I was right, but B, she, she came over on her birthday and I beat her at cards. It was the first time I ever beat her at cards and I was like, told you so, God let me beat you at cards on your birthday. <laughs> so, she finally acquiesced, and, and we settled that, that I was probably right. But when I, th I think of Carol, and I asked her where she wanted me to go with this, this talk today, and she said, you know, do what you want with it, but no, you don't have to canonize me. And I said, don't worry. <laughs> that's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but I did go to the Bible, and the, what popped out at me, the verse that popped out at me the most with Carol is Psalm 5.3. And it reads, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, sorry, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. I know because whenever I talk to Carol in the morning, I say, what did you do this morning? Well, I got up, I prayed, and I went back to bed. <laughs> she gets up early every morning, every morning. She talks to God. Every morning, God hears her voice. Every single morning. And he has heard her voice every single morning since she was a child. Every morning. And then she waits expectantly. Sometimes she hears right away, and she'll go beyond her day. Other times she doesn't, and she goes back to bed and probably waits for someone annoying like me to call her. Um, 
but when she gets up, she hears. She hears from God, and sometimes it's, take a break. You got nothing to do today. And other times it's like, oh, Carol, I got a day in store for you. And when she was young, she heard that call to be a nun, and she took it. And she followed it, and she followed it with all of her heart. And later in her life, she heard the call take her in a different direction. And can you imagine? I'm not, I never grew up in the Catholic faith. Um, so I think I had a little bit of an advantage getting to know Carol because I didn't have that fear of none <laughs> hanging over my head. <laughs> my husband did. And so when we started to get to know Carol, he was always like, <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> it's just Carol. <laughs> um, so to listen to her story, I was like, wow, what a strong woman. Look at all she left behind, her people, everybody she knew, she loved. Can you imagine leaving the Catholic Church, your friends, your family, your church, everything you have stood for your whole life because you hear Jesus saying, come follow me? Wow. Wow. And she did it. And when she tells me that story, her face lights up. She just lights up. It's beautiful. And yet she's, she has all the respect in the world for the Catholic Church. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of she listened to Jesus. And she still listens to Jesus. She still gets up in the morning. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. And so now some of the things I've witnessed Carol do... She's helped stranded motorists. We've stopped over a couple times and pulled over and yacked at people and helped them out and done what we needed to do. Um, I've witnessed her. I was lucky enough to be a pilgrim at Emmaus, and she, she was one of the leaders at Emmaus. And not only does her face sparkle and shine and her green eyes beam, and Barbara talked about her being bilocated. She was also bilocated at Emmaus. I swear one minute she was upstairs, and two seconds later she was downstairs, and everybody's like, how did she do that? But not only does her face light up, but everybody else's face lights up when they see her. Um, she's a fabulous leader, a fabulous spiritual mentor. Um, she does hospice, which we all know, and God has surely put many lives and souls in her care. In our church, she is our pastor of congregational care, and we know she has touched the life of many in our church, and, and as of late, she's been, she's been doing quite the duty. And sometimes that can be hard, but she still does it, and she does it with so much love and strength. One of my favorite things to see Carol do was Kairos, which if you're not familiar with Kairos, that is um, a prison ministry. The reason I like Kairos so much is because the day they had their graduating ceremony, I sat down with some of the people, the women who were prisoners, that Carol was working with, and her eyes were glowing and beaming. There was this one gal whose eyes were glowing and beaming, and she was going to be getting out of prison in a couple of weeks, and she sat down and she looked at me and she said, so, you know what we named her? You know what we named this gal Carol over here? We call her the Rebel Nun. <laughs> I loved it. So, Carol is the Rebel Nun. She is a rebel for Jesus. She is a rebel for Jesus. And she is the kind of rebel we should all be. And Carol, 
God doesn't ask us to learn scripture, although you have done that. He asks us to follow him. And you do that so very well. I love you. Hi, I'm Mary, Carol's sister, and it's certainly an honor to be here today, and I'm just delighted to see all of you out there to support her here today. It's a very special day. Carol told me that Pastor Bill said I had five, and I went, five hours? I can do that. And she goes, no, 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 Mary, five minutes. So I decided I had to turn learn to talk real fast. I hope y'all can keep up. <laughs> I have known Carol for 75 years. I was th she was three when I was born. And she's always been there for me in my life. I could tell you just gobs of stories. I'm going to tell you a few. Uh, when they invited me here for this roast, wait, this is not a roast, right? Oh, there I go again. Uh, I think as I stand here and look out at these people at this church and I realize I'm here to talk about Carol, I'm just grateful it's not her funeral. I think I'm supposed to be sharing with you today why I think she deserves to be ordained, but I can't do that because I don't think that she does. At least that's not her perception. Her perception is not something that she's done to, to be rewarded with this. This is something that she looks at as a great honor for her, a gift from God's grace to help her, to give her an opportunity to use with the other tools that she has where she can team with God in an effort to get, let all God's children, that's all of us, know that God loves each and every one of us, each and every one of you, and her goal always has been, and I think Barbara uh, kind of mentioned that a little bit, her goal has always been, since she was a child, to facilitate that all be brought into the family of God, and so she's spent her life doing that, and I'm going to tell you a few stories from our childhood that kind of reinforce that. You've already heard she was raised Catholic, and we were raised Catholic. My mother had eight kids, seven of us in nine years, so we were all same age. Uh, when we went to the Catholic school, the nuns told us about All Souls Day, and they believed in purgatory, and you could get somebody out of purgatory on All Souls Day if you went into the church building, and you could get one per visit, and you go in and say a series of prayers, and then you tell God who you want out. You can get your grandpa out, you can get your grandma out, you can get your best friend who accidentally died in a drowning accident, you can get the person who's been there the longest, you can get the one that's just the tiredest of being in purgatory, and they get to go to heaven. So we all went. So I went with Carol and went in and said the prayers and told God who I wanted out. At that time, I thought it's the youngest person in there ought to be able to get out of there. So uh, I'm ready to go home. We lived about a block from the church, and Carol goes, no, no, no. You can get one per visit, but that there's nothing to keep us from going out the door and coming back in. Visit two. We did about 15 people that year. Got them all, all the people we knew and all the people we didn't know, out of purgatory because Carol's perception was, hey, let's work it. <laughs> Another story I want to tell you about and share is Carol and I are professional clowns. I know that surprises most of you. Um, we, whenever we lost our mother, we went to clown school and we studied this stuff and became caring clowns. Caring clowns are hospital clowns. One day we went, we went together, we went to Children's Hospital, and one day we walked in and we hear all this wailing and yelling and screaming and crying. And the nurse saw us get off the elevator and came over there and said, hey, can y'all go in room 318? Those two girls, the accident that put them in the hospital, killed their mother and older sister. And it was time for the funeral, right now. While, while we were there, they were having the funeral and the girls couldn't go because they were not in good enough shape to be left out of the hospital. And for some reason, the family didn't have anybody stay with them. So we went to the door and poked, in, poked our heads in and they went, no, we don't wanna see clowns, go away. And so I turned around, I, we learned to respect you know, if they don't want to see you, you don't force clowning on anybody, especially today with all this Chucky and whatever all that stuff is. But uh, Carol said, wait a minute, and she stuck her head back in and she said, you know, you may not want to see clowns, but how about two sisters who lost their mother recently? And we could share stories. And so we went in and we spent almost an hour, we took off our hats and our wigs, you're not supposed to do that, so don't tell anybody we did. But uh, you go in, we went in and we sat with them for hours, for an hour, 
talked about their mother and sister and the things they're going to remember and keep dear to their heart as they go through the rest of their life with memories and the memories are going to be what sustains them and then we shared some of our stories of our mother and things that she did and, and things that would help us and then after about an hour the older girl said you know what we can do the clowns now so we put our stuff back on got all ready did our little routines carol's dog ate my flowers and the little girl made my flowers come back and we do all that stuff anyway uh carol's openness to god's inspiration is what i see it as now is you know he said don't go away stay you've got something to give these girls you've got something to share with them and we did and it, it was it was very very impressive to me later one other story when carol was eight 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 and a half she got burned real bad 70 percent burns third degree burns 70 percent of her body and I already told you, and we've said it, my mother had eight kids, and the youngest was less than a month old. And Carol had to go about a half hour and a half or two hours away from our house. But back in those days, you know, that was a long trip. That was longer than we see it is today. And so mom and daddy took Carol to that hospital, Shriners Hospital in Galveston, and left her. Now here's an eight and a half year old recovering from 70% burns over her body, with not a person around who knows her and loves her and I think of that story and I still I, I can still close my eyes and see Carol Byrne uh, because we were all outside when it happened but when I think of that story now I realize she could have let that experience turn her into a bitter hateful angry person but she chose not to because she accepted God's God's using that experience and she you know we all know people who blame their childhood you know it's well when i was a child this happened and that's why i am the way i am well you know what if you're still doing that i see all these gray hairs out here y'all got to get over it because that's definitely definitely not something we should be doing we need to get over what we blame in our childhood for but that's not what i'm up here talking about today so i'm going to go on uh but carol let that experience work into her to help her become more compassionate she can understand pain she knows pain and she can understand pain and so she definitely let like romans 8 28 says god works together all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose and carol let that happen we don't have to that's kind of like an invitation as i see it but carol let that happen and and i know she's been called according to his purpose and i've witnessed that many times over my life and i also know that when god calls carol answers uh, carol said one time you know God says, Carol, and I go, what? <laughs> you know, so she's definitely listening to him. And so she's set her goal in accordance with God's dream. God has a dream, and his dream is given in Second Peter that all should repent and come to salvation and, and, and eventually end out in heaven with him. And Carol's goal is that also as she teams with God. Carol recently wrote a book. I typed it for her. But she wrote a book, and uh, it's called Teaming with God. And in that whole book, you can see time and time again that she did things that that made it where she was definitely working that so all in all I say congratulations Carol I'm very proud of you uh, and I'm delighted again to be able to be up to address you for a little bit and I thank you all for uh, the love and support that I know you give Carol and will continue to give her because as things progress we need it more and more not less and less so y'all love her and y'all support her in this church shore her up and keep her as her little worker with God, worker for God. Thank you. Would you all rise and join me in singing Holy, Holy, Holy. adore thee casting down their gold 
golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim come down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be. You may be seated. Okay, that's all right. I don't know about you, but all these stories and hagiography about Carol <laughs> making her into a saint. What I learned today in those previous three stories is that this is a useless instrument. You try to put Carol in a box, <laughs> tell her how she's supposed to behave, whether she's seven years old or a nun or a church care person or a Baptist, uh, this is kind of pointless. I love those stories because Carol, you know, I'm, so, I'm supposed to be doing the witness for American Baptist Church of the Rocky Mountain. What I heard is there's a little bit of nun, a little bit of Catholic, a little bit of United Church of Christ, a little bit of rebel, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And all of that came together, and she said, this is where God is calling me, and I'm going to go there. And, and you, you know, we all know that today it takes 15 minutes. Before you leave this place, you could probably get on the Internet and be ordained. Carol said, no, that's not what I need. God's calling. I'm going to follow God. You will keep leading me and showing me the right pastor, the right church, the right avenue, and I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to do it the way God tells me. <clears throat> and if other people don't like it, they can take their box and go home. Sorry, I stole this out of your office. I, I didn't plan that. I just had a moment of, uh, as I was sitting there listening to these stories. What we as American Baptists would say to you is Carol came in and she was a meek little mouse and she said, what do you want me to tell you? And she told us exactly what we wanted to hear. What Carol did is she came in and said, this is my story with God and where I walk, God goes with me. And I hear him say things to my spirit, and I act. And I would love to partner with you as Baptist, even though I was raised Catholic and have a little bit of rebel and a little bit of nun and a little bit of United Church of Christ in me. Is that all right? And she would have said, if we would have said no, she would have said, okay, you can take your box and do whatever you want with it. I. But we didn't. We saw and heard this giftedness and this calling and this passion for doing ministry. And we know that with people like Carol, it gives people like me, who can at times be a little stuffy and a little straight-laced, not always, making us wonder and question and stretch and grow. And so our witness to you is that, yes, Carol came before our committee. She did her homework. She did the work on understanding what Baptist was. And she said, I can work with that. In fact, I think her words were something like that. I think I was Baptist before I, 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 I ever participated in this process. There's just a lot of in me that's Baptist. And so she said, and so we said, yes, this is us as American Baptists saying yes in a big way. And we may have our little boxes that she hurts and breaks when she gets a little rebellious, but we're okay with that. And we love her and we are, we are glad to celebrate with Ecumenical Church in uh, this time of setting aside, encouraging and anointing 
Carol and saying, we see what you see. We see God already at work in her. It's not that she gets to do work because we put our stamp of approval or because she's in our box. It's that we see God already at work and we want to join with that work. So my job today is to give a charge to the candidate. I want to begin by sharing a passage of scripture. It is one that we have heard many times, but it is one that I think is especially appropriate today. It's found in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then when the wolf attacks the flock, it scatters. The man runs away because he has hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know the sheep. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the father's know, father knows me, I know the, know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock. We come today to ordain Carol Simpson. Carol Simpson. <laughs> Carol, we come today to ordain Carol. But Carol, despite all these wonderful words that have been shared today about you, the wonderful things you've done, the way you've touched... That's not why we're ordaining you today. We're ordaining you today because we believe God has called you to be his under-shepherd. And just as Jesus gave this testimony about what it means to be a shepherd, now in your case, normally when I say this, I would be using the vocative voice that this is what you're supposed to do. But in your case, I'm going to use the progressive, uh, present progressive. This is what you need to continue to do. And, and one of those is, and one of those is, is, is that idea that there is not just one flock of sheep out there. Christ died for us all, and he, he has many different flavors of sheep, I guess is, is the way I would say that. And you know that. And now you're, you're, you're currently serving with a combination of a Baptist and, and Presbyterian and whatever else is the mix of ecumenical church. Previously, it was the, the Catholic. But, but, but God calls us wherever we're at. His desire is that we all be one flock, that we all know that Christ came and died, that we might have life in him. And you are called to take that message and you've been taking that message and you're called to continue to take that message but but the second thing that i want to encourage you to continue doing is knowing the sheep and allowing the sheep to know you you see the reality is we cannot do ministry we cannot help people understand how much god loves them until we allow the love that god has shown to us to flow through us into the lives of other people. You, you have to, to, to let them know that you love them. I, I was struck as I, I read that today. I've, I've read that passage many times at these services, and I, I was stu struck as I read that passage today. You, you do not, the, the thief runs away because the thief does not own the sheep. Now, to own something means that you have invested in it in, in some way. So, so part of owning the sheep, part of, of being able to, to, to know the sheep and to have the sheep know you, a, a part of the way that we, it is to invest in them. I, I, I heard through those testimonies how you have invested in, in the lives of so many people. And, and so the charge is don't stop investing. Be a day trader. <laughs> Keep investing in other people's lives. And lay down your life for them, just as Christ did. You've already done that. 
Continue to do that. that. That's my charge today. But you know, one of the things that Jesus did when he gave a charge was he always tried to symbolize that in some way. And so today we're going to symbolize that by, by bestowing upon you a, a very simple stole. Now, a stole it has been a symbol uh, in, in the church for many years. It, there, there are many different interpretations. There are many different flavors. They're the ones for loud, obnoxious people. They're, they're the ones for, <laughs> for, for, for people who are, are a little more formal. <laughs> and, and then and then and then there are, are are just some kind of simple ones but but the main thing about all stoles is that they remind us of the towel that jesus wrapped around him on the night that that he he was betrayed and you know the story he washed the disciples feet but the important part of the story is when he's done what you have seen me do unto you go and do unto others the, the stole is a reminder that, that, that w when, you're, when you've been called to serve, you're supposed to serve. A a and that's, that's one thing that I want you to remember as you wear, wear this stole. But you will notice that this is not a white stole. It's not a multicolored stole. It's not a red stole. If you know anything about church here, it's a green stole. And a green stole is worn at a very particular time of the year. It's called ordinary time. It's not when we celebrate the high festivals. It's not during the time of, of Advent. It's not during the Christmas tide. It's not during Lent. It's not during the time of year we're presently in Easter. It's, it's all that ordinary time, the, the regular time of the year that sometimes things get a little boring. Sometimes things, you know, it's, and, and, and we present a green stole. Well, really partly because it goes well with our logo, but we present a green stole primarily because it's easy, easy sometimes to serve people in holiday times and special times and when somebody's dying or somebody's... In, but it's not always as easy during the ordinary time. And the green stole is to remind you that you're called to serve during ordinary time as well as the special times as well as the times that are easier. And finally, we present this particular stole because, well, it was made and it was woven by some missionary partners we have. It was, it was woven by the Lahu tribe in Thailand, who um, are, are, some of their tribe was in Myanmar, and our first missionaries as Baptists were in Myanmar. So it reminds us of the missionary effort that, that uh, that we as Baptists have, have undertaken. We had it um, embroidered with the logo of the American Baptist Churches of the Rocky Mountains. And, and all that is to remind you that sometimes we get a little territorial. Sometimes we think we're doing this all alone. Sometimes we, we forget that, that there is that other flock out there. And so this, this stole, we hope, will remind you of that other flock. And so I'm going to ask you to come up, Carol. And we're going to place this stole on you as a reminder of what God is calling and charging you to do. Blessed be the services today. Amen. Those of us who have been to uh, walk to Emmaus know this song, so sing it out good and loud. Here I am, Lord. Would you stand, please? Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will say, here I am, Lord, is I. I have heard my people cry, go and leave me, leave my heart. I am Lord, it is. 
seated. Please observe that there's some sections you respond to. I will. <laughs> I got something else to say first. <laughs> so, she has been such an awesome addition to this church from the day she got here. And we always knew she was a nun. My wife was raised Catholic, my best friend was raised Catholic. And this is not a roast, okay? This is a serious thing, probably as serious as a nun in a habit. That's serious. Glasses. <laughs> Lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? I have heard the call of Christ, and in the words of Isaiah I respond, Here I am, send me. Have you, Carol? Gratefully considered the responsibilities of living and preaching the gospel, and have you weighed the work involved in the sacrifices you may be called to make? I have. Do you, Carol, believe that Christ or that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and that the Holy Scriptures and the Word of God to make us wise upon the salvation through faith in Him? I do with all my heart. Are you motivated not out of the desire for position or earthly gain, but by the love of God and your fellow people and the wish to glorify him and save them? I am. Will you strive to build up the church, the body of Christ, to prepare God's people for works of service, to labor for the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God? I will, as God gives me the strength. Will you endeavor in your life to love within your family and community and to draw others to Christ through your examples as well as by your word? I will make it the purpose of my life to live for Jesus Christ, and I ask for your prayers and the prayers of this church to help me in this ministry. Have you members of this Christian assembly carefully considered qualifications of Carol for working of the ministry and as a servant of Christ. Are you satisfied that she will be a worthy messenger and representative of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing that she should be ordained to this Christian ministry? The apostles as they would start churches, as the Apostle Paul would start churches and he'd pull a church together and, and he'd appoint elders, one of the things that they would do is they would gather around and lay hands on uh, the person being ordained. So at this time, I would last, like to ask our, our guests, um, in, in, uh, Steve and Mike, and any elders of this congregation who are here today to please come up.
carol this, this, this day, we are simply recognizing what God has already done. This day, we are ordaining you as a person who's been set aside for service to God. Let's pray. Gracious and wonderful God, we thank you for this servant, for the life that she gives, for the life that she lives, the way she shares, uh, not just her faith, but from everything that she is and everything that she has. We ask, God, that you would bless this beautiful sister, that you would continue to lead her and use her as a shepherd, as a friend, and as a fellow journeyer on this journey with Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my very first acts as an ordained minister is to give you a blessing. And I wonder sometimes if you have any idea what an awesome experience it is to bless people who are blessed by God. Every single one of you is a blessing to God and to me. I do love you. I don't just say that. I try to live that. I know you by name, and I know a few other things too, but we won't talk about that. What we will talk about is that what I know, I'll love. I don't know what I would do without you. My sister Mary hit it on the head when she said you've been good to me and ask you to still do that. And I know you will because I've experienced it. I am very loved in this church, and I am a very lover in this church. And so when it comes time to give a blessing, we in our church do something special, and I'm going to invite us to do that because I think it's very meaningful. But I want you to stand, and we always raise one hand up to God because it's God who, who blesses us. It's not me. It's God. And God comes through this hand, crosses through my heart, goes out this hand, and goes to you. And you're doing the same thing to me. So I'm experiencing God, letting it ruminate in my heart, and sending it out to you. And I'm accepting back what you are giving to me. I just invite you to go and the love that you already have from God, from me, and from each other. Let us always love one another. Amen. Yay! Woo! I'd like to uh, invite you all to join us in our closing song, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. And remember, I'm going to ask Carol if she'll go ahead and go back to the back. And uh, if, if she wants to... Um, drag along a couple of her guests they can all greet you as you're, as you're leaving with the right hand of fellowship let's sing together make me a channel of your peace sing loud because I don't know this song
heard a lot of Bob Dylan imitations out there. That's all right. This concludes our uh, service of ordination. Um, please greet Pastor Carol and uh, join us for fellowship in the fellowship hall.